Welcome everyone. So today we'll have presentation around using AI and machine learning in pavement asset management. Our presenters today would be Tim Cross, the Business Intelligence Advisory Manager, as well as David Rollinson for Data Science and Analytics Technical Lead. I would now like to get started and hand over to Tim, if you'd like to let us know about a bit more. Excellent. Thank you, Simone. Um, uh, welcome everyone uh, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm joined here today by my colleague Dave Rawlinson and maybe Dave you can just uh, bring camera on screen. Oh and unmute. Hello <laughs> nice, nice to meet you. Yeah. Cool um, I, I guess just uh, just just a point for for uh, for our presentation uh, we move on to on to our what we're going to share with you this uh, this afternoon. Um, Dave joins us from Melbourne, uh, so it is morning his time. Next slide, Dave. Yep. So, just in terms of uh, looking at the potential use of of AI and machine learning technologies uh, in in uh, in road asset management, looking at the pitfalls and how we can how we can drive to success. Uh, it's a case of, I guess, within this within this presentation, there'll be a showcase uh, or sort of uh, showcase or overview, really, of of some key technologies that we have been using, uh, that we're seeing more in use across the road sector, um, that will help you to understand a bit more about how advanced we are in this area. Um, uh, before we begin, uh, I'm going to share with you a karakia. Yohora te marino, kia fakapapa. Honamu te moana. Ei huarahi ma tato ite rangi nei. Aroha atu, aroha mai, tato ya tato kato, uie taikie. To start, um, uh, just uh, the, the uh, just in terms of the material that we're going to share, um, it is part of a. Uh, uh, a lot of the material uh, relates to research that we've undertaken for Austroads over the last two years. Uh, Dave, uh, and Dave and his team in, in Australia and me and my team in New Zealand uh, have, provided, uh, have provided this research uh, direct to the road sector, uh, that, uh, the peak organisation of Austroads uh, that covers road agencies and uh, uh, including state and territory uh, national road agencies here in New Zealand, as well as all local authorities. Uh, we've prepared a report uh, which is available uh, through the Austroads website. Um, best way is to Google AAM 6201 if you want to find, uh, our, to find our report. Um, and in addition, we've provided a, a, a quick guide. Uh, and that, that provides uh, a whole series of, of pieces of information with regard to how to best run and develop a machine learning or artificial intelligence project. Um, this is guidance that has been designed uh, uh, not uh, has been designed specific to our client in Austroads for the road sector, but is not in any way exclusive. It's a case of this material is there to help and is applicable for for the development and adaption of any particular. Uh, machine learning or AI project that could be, uh, and and the guidance is there, uh, helpful uh, for for anyone, and is available for free through the Austroads website. So we encourage you to check out those resources, uh, and we'll be referring to some of them uh, through through this presentation. So the potential. This is a case with our with with use of machine learning and and artificial intelligence that. Um, you know, we're really wanting to use these technologies in recognition of particularly points of automation or ease of ease of use of technology, um, either because we have a huge amount of data that needs to be processed and don't want to resort to manual processing, or a case of us needing to discover or or learn on a level uh, that is that that uh, would otherwise take us enormous amounts of time. And I guess points here with regard to uh, improving and striving towards improvement in the way that we work. Um, often things can take too long, uh, you know, from from our teams trying to get answers. 
recognizing that there can be that we can have issues with our existing systems and that this can present certain operational and reputational risk um, that um, that we need to have uh, actionable insights you know that that can take time to actually drive and get to and um, and data is not necessarily useful all of the time uh, it may be that we need to um, to actually discover and understand can the process of actually generating information and knowledge can take a long time. Um, it's a case of sometimes we, we find ourselves and I think typically now in our work environments there's so much happening and we're having to react to so many things all at once. Um, how do we drive to better outcomes? Um, how do we make sure that that uh, that we're using we're using smart tools and systems, uh, and I guess the, the more software that is uh, that is that is developed that helps us to to improve efficiency in our work. Um, it's a case of these tools just keep increasing in in in, in number uh, and present fresh challenges for us. How can we how can we drive to a simplified outcome? Uh, reliable so single sources of truth. How can we uh, you know if 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 the numbers are being challenged? The ability to be able to explain in those situations and uh, at the same time recognizing that that change when it occurs in our organizations uh, be it actually in our organizations or in our own personal lives it can be a real challenge so uh, so the, the question is how do we really gain the benefits of this technology with regard to with regard to asset management um, particular but it is a case of, of in all in all cases, some significant challenge. Um, in summary, um, a case of us really recognizing that we need to we want to enhance our awareness of what's around us and 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 uh, uh, the more data that we collect, our ability to be able to to process that, understand and increase and develop um, evidence based evidence bases for decision making. We want to ultimately improve uh, the efficiencies of our processes and um, and of um, yeah, using these technologies to uh, to improve on those points um, and uh, recognize and manage risks. Um, certainly something that 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 becomes increasingly important uh, as we as we work with more data and issues of security, privacy related to data uh, enters into the frame. So let's look at pavement modeling. Now, I guess from a point of view of, of this, particularly from, from uh, more from, say, general public perspective, uh, it's a case of the road is there. The road is, is there. It's, it's, it's a reliable means for me to be able to travel from A to B. We probably don't think so much about the significance of that infrastructure when we actually use it. It's, it's a case of um, we, we just expect it to be there. We expect it to help us to to get us where we need it to go. Need us to go, um, but the process of actually figuring out material uh, priority of of particular project to de to to deliver, um, understanding topography, understanding environment, you know the 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 degree in, of of uh, of volume, uh, say the number of lanes on particular roads or bridges. All of this becomes a really significant challenge. Uh, it's a complex question um, of actually establishing where roads should be. Um, and uh, and I didn't mention, but particularly before, but particularly in the social and political space, um, this can be a really labor intensive and really challenging situation. How do we make sure that uh, we're actually investing in the right infrastructure at the right time? A uh, huge number of decisions to be made, and actually very few people uh, at the at the very sort of top end decision making point who actually have the knowledge to be able to make those decisions. So, a case here of um, of really, you know, this is a space where there is a lot of challenge and the need for a lot of data to help to answer questions. Um, in asset management. Uh, just as an example for the chart to the to the left to explain this, this is a deterioration curve. And if you look at the graph from the far left, 
uh, the, f the furthest left point there represents uh, the condition of an asset when it's first built, an as-built asset. Uh, and over time, as the asset is used and as um, as environmental factors feed into feed into this, um, you can expect some deterioration of that asset as it ages. And the the um, the arcing that you see uh, of the curve there um, as it comes down. Just the, the midpoint there where you see we see a vertical line and then the and then the arc continue. It's a case of at points in time, in order for us to extend the life of an asset, we need to apply some form of intervention. Uh, it might be some form of maintenance or or uh, or a, a direct improvement uh, outside of the existing asset in order to be able to extend its life. So from from this point of view, this is a fairly well defined um, curve, but it varies depending on all of those environmental and use factors. Um, so it's a case of these are the, this is the sort of curve that we could use to model to improve uh, our understanding of the impacts of deterioration. And if you think about Auckland Harbour Bridge, for example, a massive asset and extremely expensive asset to replace, we don't want to find ourselves having to replace major assets all the time if we have to. Um, if we can do anything, and if we can intervene through those sorts of points to improve the, the life of an asset, then that means that we have these, these infrastructure assets for much, much longer. And that's far more desirable uh, than, than having to continually replace assets. Um, to the right are examples of areas that we're going to, I'm going to touch on very soon, where we're using these technologies, these, these are particular areas where we are currently using machine learning and artificial intelligence to improve that decision making. To start uh, defect detection, and this example shows uh, the inside of a sewerage pipe uh, as opposed to a road, uh, but, the, but the rules around this are very much the same. A case of, of uh, using in this, in this example, we have a robot that's rolling through, um, picking up uh, through video footage, uh, all of uh, I guess it's picking up all of the all, uh, all of the uh, the vision as it's traveling along, but um, overlaid through that is machine learning uh, that's helping to understand or detect particular uh, defects. And uh, this is an area that has been is being well advanced in its uh, in, in form. Um, I guess there are there may be certain exceptions of particular defects that may arise in time. But uh, with regard to being able to detect um, particular defects uh, or the majority of defects, uh, the technology is already there for us to be able to achieve that. Um, we already have a number of pre-trained models that can achieve that. Um, and I would say that more from a sort of sector wide perspective. So the potential to use this technology right now is right there for us now. It's good. Uh, condition and infer inference. Um, if you think about, uh, if you look at looking at the map here, case of, of uh, we need to be under, it's important for us to understand the condition of, of road at any particular point in time. Uh, but as you can imagine, it's, it's, it's not very easy for us to be able to measure that uh, uh, very easily uh, all of the time. Uh, perhaps as we as we have more connected vehicles and more uh, say uh, cameras that can pick up on road uh, information, then potentially we are able to do this more often. Uh, but for, and but I guess for now, um, it tends to be more by inspection uh, and uh, a case of a case of over time. How do we make sure that we're we're making the right calls when it comes back to that deterioration curve? Um, uh, for the for the time being, this is a, this is a space that is advancing more, that will be enhanced as we have more connected vehicles, and uh, and a case of us being able to to look at the look at information on an individual asset or network level, and really understand where should we be investing, and that leads to the next to the next area, uh, in terms of scheduling and programming of of projects. Uh, it's a case of in this in this space, uh, most road agencies are in a very uh, are in a very mature space in this in this area. Um, case of understanding uh, what uh, what projects 
what road, road projects should be invested in at what time. Um, but it is still a challenge when it comes to uh, it comes to growth uh, and being able to ensure that what we're investing in is the right infrastructure at the right time. Uh, when it comes to the future, like where, do, where, where would we need infrastructure to be invested in uh, for the future? So uh, if we consider in this example, uh, these this, this, these are uh, cycle lane or a cycle lane invest or cycle route uh, investment. Um, where should we be putting these? Uh, put where should we be, be? We where should we be putting this infrastructure? What is the, I guess the the decision process around um, around the volumes uh, and the connectivity? Uh, it's a, a case here of this this space still being a developing area. Um, but one where I guess decisions when they're when uh, well when proposals are put forward, how we move forward and deliver on these um, still still is a, a still a case of of some human intervention uh, required, and I guess in time, uh, you know the the I guess the thinking here, you know, there's potential here for machines to be able to provide more input into the process here. Um, to aid in decision. Uh, when it comes to, and that sort of leads into operational business intelligence. This is a space where, uh, particularly in New Zealand, is still is still in a space of development. Um, the uh, the the data that we have is advanced in such a way, and to a point. Uh, where we're we're able to answer particular questions uh, to particular uses, um, and and we have a number of tools, including uh, Power Platform, that can help us to to visualize uh, data that would that has otherwise been stacked in spreadsheets. Uh, this is a this is a, a still I think for us as we advance in this, although machines could be in a space to actually generate business intelligence on our own. Uh, for our own benefit, uh, that we need to actually define what is intelligent, what is intelligence for us, and uh, I think as as machines show us more or can generate more information for us, it's a case of us being able to explore that information more, better, uh, and uh, and make calls on I guess to help to I guess aiding and advancing the conversation of what really matters for our communities moving forward. Um, and uh, so, so for now, a space that is still uh, very much in development and is of benefit for for everyone to really invest in for us to better understand our world. Cool. Um, I'm now going to pass over to Dave, who will take us through the pitfalls of this technology. Thanks, Dave. Thanks. Thanks, Tim. Um, nice to meet everybody. Um, so as Tim mentioned, um, this section of the talk is going to be about uh, some of the ways in which people can come unstuck trying to adopt AIML technology into their organisations with a particular focus on asset management and particularly pavement asset management from some of the experiences we've had. Um, in addition to uh, our own direct experience of projects, a lot of this experience also comes from reading about and talking to people about uh, their experiences in other projects um, as well. And if we would sort of distill that experience down, like we, we find that these three obstacles on screen now are the three most common reasons that projects fail to transition from a proof of concept R&D exercise into a solution that actually can be used in day-to-day -day, you know, business. So what's really interesting is that all three of these obstacles are not actually technical obstacles to do with AIML. They are obstacles to do with the way the project is managed and run and defined and then you know, the way in which it's integrated into a business. So the first of those is that the project lacks a quantifiable value proposition. So what that means is that often people create an idea for a project and they have an idea about how it would be valuable or be used, but it, it's not fleshed out enough. It's not grounded. It's not turned into something that can be quantified and measured properly. Um, so it might be, you know, it'll increase productivity, but 
how would we measure that? How much would it increase project product productivity? You know, how uh, how do we define a successful intervention there? And so that lack of a key value proposition that can be measured leads to sort of support and momentum for a project sort of eroding over time. The second obstacle that we often see is that the project becomes focused on demonstrating a capability rather than develop, building a solution. So what does what does that mean? What what is the, what is demonstrating a capability? Well, it might be you've got some data and you you, you show that you can predict something. So you've demonstrated this capability to predict, but does that give you the ability to make use of those predictions? Actually, there's a heap of extra work needed to move from, in theory, being able to predict, like say, the failure of a, a pipeline or like the deterioration of a road surface, to being able to actually exploit that that knowledge in a useful and you know, money saving way. So, so coming back to that first point about the quantifiable value proposition, you know, how is predicting something going to save money or you know, increase revenue or improve efficiency? Um, and so this aspect of building a solution leads into the third obstacle, which is about underestimating the change management and the barriers that creates to adoption. So it's not enough to just have a solution, even a solution that's perfectly good and does everything that you need. You've still got to sort of create the the, the process for change and adoption and allow people to do that in a, in a low risk, uh, secure way that, that everyone can sort of get on board and feel comfortable progressing with. And, um, you know, it, a lot of these projects can be quite disruptive to the way the business operates. And so, you know, that can be a significant barrier. So while that previous slide was about, you know, non-technical considerations, this slide is more about, you know, probably the, the most significant technical consideration of uh, adopting new AI ML projects into an organisation. And that is that measuring complex models is very hard to do well. Um, now, one of the, the sort of common mistakes is that it's easy to measure the wrong thing because you'll have some data, you'll have some, some uh, you know, proxy, let's say, for what's really important. What's really important is what's going to happen in the future when you deploy the system in the real world. What you actually have is data that historically represents conditions and events that happened in the past. And, um, and, and often you can't directly measure you know, the event that happened or the, the variables leading up to it. But you've got other things, you've got other data, and you're trying to sort of make this jump from the data that you have into the data that will be experienced by a system in production. And making that jump can introduce all sorts of bias, like differences, statistical differences between the data that you've trained your model on and the data that will occur in the future. Another common problem in this measurement process is, is protocol errors such as data leakage, which is where you sort of accidentally give the model uh, sort of you know, a leg up, like a, a boost or a free advantage that it then exploits and makes you think that you've got a successful solution. But then later on, as you try to sort of deploy it into production, you discover that actually it doesn't behave the way that you thought it did. And potentially, like this is not all that rare, all of your conclusions about the performance of the model and the viability of your AI ML solution can be invalidated by making a protocol error. Okay, and you know, the, the, the sort of screenshots there to show that um, this isn't something that just happens to people who you know, don't have enough expertise or experience or, you know, uh, don't have a big enough, you know, experienced enough team. Like even the best teams um, in academia and industry uh, have made big mistakes of this nature. And in fact, this is a topic that researchers have been looking at in detail. And the screenshot here is, is from a uh, academic survey paper. It's actually a meta review of 20 other papers that in total looked at 329 uh, academic papers on the application of machine learning. And so in theory, and, and across a, you know, a range of different disciplines, so you've got medicine there, you've got nutrition research, software engineering, toxicology, satellite imaging, you know, it's such a broad range of fields. What we're seeing again and again, uh, indicated by all the dots in the middle here, is that you know, the same methodological errors are being repeated um, by numerous different uh, scientists across numerous different disciplines. And that is because it is really hard to um, measure the performance of machine learning systems. Now, one of the things when when Tim and I were sort of talking about, you know, 
emerging latest cutting edge technologies in um, pavement asset management and asset management more generally. Um, we couldn't ignore the sort of emergence since the start of the year of chat GPT. And, um, and, you know, that is currently sort of is zooming around the world, like experiencing a huge amount of adoption, threatening to be incredibly disruptive in a lot of industries. And I think asset management is not going to escape from that. And I've, I've titled this slide ChatGPT and large language models. And, um, and so I think it's important to understand that ChatGPT is one example of a family of models called large language model or LLMs. And now there are other offerings from uh, there's the, the Bing version, there's, um, there's Google, uh, Bard, you know, there's, there's several um, emerging. And um, yeah, there's a huge amount of excitement about the opportunity they provide. Um, but I think the reason that we included it in this section is because that also comes with some significant risks. And I'll try and sort of cover both the, the sort of potential and the risks in this section. So large language models essentially are trained to sort of take a piece of text and generate a continuation of that text, you know, what's going to come next. They always create the impression that they understand what's going on, what's being talked about. And in fact, when they're wrong, they're actually very confident still in their responses. And um, I think that is, is something really to be sort of very conscious of, because when you talk to a, a person and they and they're not confident about their answer or their knowledge in the space, then, you know, usually they will tell you, I'm not sure, but you don't necessarily get the same sort of, um, you know, qualification in the responses from a large language model. And so that can sort of really sort of set you up to fail because, you know, it creates this impression that it, it understood your question and this is the answer when that may in fact not be the case. So LLMs are best suited for problems where there isn't a correct answer or where it's okay to be wrong. And at first you might think, well, surely everyone always wants the correct answer. But in fact, there are a lot of situations where there is no correct answer. So, for example, if you've got a, a report that somebody's written, there is no definitive correct summarization of that report and the sentiment in that report. You know, subjectively, you could say, well, this is a better summary of that piece of text, but you can't say anything as this is wrong or this is correct. And uh, similarly, if you've got text about, say, for example, user complaints or reports of issues, you know, you don't so much care about like being absolutely correct about the details of those reports but what you want is the sort of you know the overall uh, results over lots of those reports to be you know not strongly biased and that means that 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 tool then creates a way for you to digest a large amount of text and um, and sort of get some insights out of it um, another area where I think LLMs are right now a great tool is to learn about a new topic and they're pretty good at making sure they will tell you about domain specific technology, terminology, teaching you about new concepts. Um, so if you want to learn about something, then talking to a large language model, you know, having one of those chat sessions can be a really good, quick way to sort of get on top of it. And they can analyze a lot of data very quickly. And um, particularly in an asset management context, I can see why that would be very useful because, you know, particularly in asset management, we tend to accumulate a lot of data. And some of that data is sort of unstructured text, which would be great if you could sort of push that into an AI and it would sort of condense it all down and tell you the sort of main issues. But um, a couple of things that we would really flag here is the data protection issues. So if you're using large language model in general with those services, you are uploading your data to the cloud and losing control of that data. So there's serious data protection issues with the, the ownership of that data. And then secondly, you know, th there's no guarantee that if you're doing a sort of statistical analysis with, with that kind of data, there's no guarantee the, the answer is going to be correct. And so when should you not use a large language model? Um, I, I think an easy way to think of it is that you shouldn't use a large language model when it's important that you have correct specific answers. So for example, if I, I read this quote the other day, if banking software was 99% correct, we'd still be using paper and pencils. And uh, there are some applications like banking, right, where if one in 100 people had a zeroed out bank balance, you know, they would be pretty unhappy. So you can't accept 99% correct in a banking context. And it, you know, similarly, that would make that an inappropriate use case for large language models. Another use case where 
LLMs are sort of demonstrating great promise is in being able to write code for people. And that is potentially a huge, um, you know, enabling factor for asset managers in that if you could if you could easily just talk to it and get it to write code that would analyze this vast trove of essentially like unused data right now, it's unused because there's just so much of it, you can't do things with it without you know, having somebody who can write that code. If it could write that code for you, then, you know, potentially the advantages, the rewards are fantastic. The experience that myself and, you know, my colleagues and, you know, people we know in this space have is that they can write code for you and um, often they can write some pretty good code pretty quickly. But we are sort of wary of recommending that people, you know, ask AIs to write code for them unless they can write their own code. And the reason is that when we ask for code, we often notice that particularly sort of data science or technical code has subtle bugs in it, which don't necessarily make it crash, but it means that the numbers that you get out may not be the correct numbers. Now, if you can read and verify the code yourself, then you know, you've got that acceleration of, of it having sort of created the code for you quickly. But if you can't read and verify the code, then you know, you're taking a huge risk there that the answers are not correct. And if you're writing code, you probably want correct answers. So at this stage, you know, I'd probably say if you don't have people who can review the code, and it may not be safe to use those tools. So to summarize all that, like for asset managers, LLMs are potentially this powerful new tool. It could dramatically increase the ability to make use of your existing data uh, for better decision making. And potentially they provide greater access to sophisticated statistical methods that could be applied to you know, all, of, all of this sort of data that's currently hard to interpret, such as you know, unstructured text, but you know, use with that extreme caution. There's a lot of hype out there right now. But um, you know, I think take some of it with a pinch of salt, and um, you know, absolutely start exploring it to sort of help yourself learn about about new concepts and and domains and technologies. But um, yeah, just think about you know how important it is that the result that is given you is correct. On that note, we're going to move into more about yeah you know, the practical strategies that that Tim and I have um, distilled in order to how to succeed. And if you remember at the start, Tim talked about. Uh, the guide that we wrote for Ostroads and a lot of these sort of strategies and you know the potential pitfalls are all sort of covered in that guide. So um, you know in more detail. But here's some of the sort of key ones that we we would call out. The first is about how you would run a project. And um, if you remember, you know, our initial obstacles that prevent people from taking a project to successful production, like a lot of them were about how you run and define the project, not so much about um, not so much about the AI ML technical obstacles. And so, you know, in response, our success strategies are also about how you run a project. Now, the software in, software engineering industry of the last sort of maybe 20 years or so has pretty much wholesale moved from the model on the left, which we call the waterfall model, to the model on the right. And probably the waterfall model is still sort of more popular in uh, asset management or in general engineering context. And the waterfall model is essentially a linear process that starts with requirements and design and um, moves into development and then testing and deployment and maintenance. So th those, those sort of stages are also really heavily software focused, but the key thing is it's a linear process. Now, the, the problem with the waterfall model was this incredible hubris that at the start, you could foresee all of the issues that would come up in development and testing and deployment and uh, you know, preempt all of those, work them into the, the planning of the project, the requirements and design phase, you know, and solve them there. And of course, that turned out to be spectacularly untrue for software in general. Now, AI and machine learning is even more uncertain because you're you're talking about like complex statistical models and generally like doing something that's novel and new and different that's never been done before. So how on earth were you supposed to uh, foresee all of the potential difficulties at the start. So for that reason, the, the software industry, and we would recommend strongly for AI ML projects also move to the agile methodology, which is on the right. And the key thing about the agile methodology is that it takes away that requirement to you know, predict everything at the start and it replaces it with a sort of iterative process where you, you, you first, you develop something. And that might be just requirements. It might be sort of 
finding data, integrating data, you know, talking to people, learning something. Um, you release something, which might be findings, might be some code. Um, you evaluate it. You take it back to your stakeholders and you get that feedback. And then based on that feedback, you define what you're going to do next. And that sort of iterative process is much more steadily and surely moving towards a successful outcome. Um, and, and at first, it seems like a very hard jump to make because, you know, how many steps are you going to need to get to the end? But it turns out it actually does do, deliver better results. The second tip that we would give is to try to build truthy integrated digital solutions. And the reason for that is that these solutions tend to be more useful than you anticipated at the start. And therefore, it's, it's much easier to sort of sustain that momentum and interest and, and value to sort of take it all the way to production and deliver something valuable. So what does truthy mean? Well, often you've got a lot of data in an organization. You may have many copies or versions of the same data. You might have different systems, often legacy systems that are somewhat siloed and um, yeah, they have some interactions with each other, some shared you know, entities or concepts, but you know, the the in integrity of the relationships between those those data sets you know, may be suspect or incomplete. Uh, there may be no active management of the consistency between those data sets. And generally in an AI ML project, one of the first things we do is we build these like integrated data sets. And often when we do that, we find all these people come out of the woodwork and say, hey, you've got the best data set in this entire organization. We had to solve that data integration problem in order to proceed any further and as a consequence we've got this incredibly valuable asset and um and having solved those integration issues and and having created a process to keep that data up to date so that we can deploy an ai ml solution uh, we've actually created this data set that is you know closer to the truth to reality than any of the others and uh, it's more integrated, whereas maybe things weren't so integrated before. And as an example of the value of that, um, some of my colleagues worked on a system called Land IQ, which was written about in the Australian Financial Review screenshot here. And um, that was actually a planning platform. Uh, but um, what they found is that during the, um, the New South Wales flood cleanup, uh, the system was actually incredibly useful because it was truthy, because it was integrated and it had these great tools to pull in all these different data sets. So they found it was useful beyond the intentions of the original system design. And that tends to be something that happens when you build these truthy integrated solutions. The next tip that we would give would be to build decision support systems rather than automation. Um, so what's a decision support system? It's where instead of trying to get the machine to essentially solve the problem and do the whole job, you explicitly design the system to help people do their jobs better, more productively, more efficiently. And um, to sort of help you grasp that concept, this is a screenshot from a system that um, I worked on uh, with uh, a hospital in Australia. And um, in this case, the the original problem that the radiologists had was that they needed to sort of do a sort of spot the difference exercise when they're comparing to um, 3D brain scans. And um, what the software did is instead of making a diagnosis and asking them to say, you know, am I correct? The software was designed to highlight differences as a sort of shortlist and then ask the radiologist for their opinion on each of the items in the, in the shortlist. And then they would still do a, a full check to see if there was anything that was missed. And um, this was sort of tested in in peer review, um, in peer review study, and uh, and published. And yeah, you know, I think it's used by a few hospitals now. And it turns out it was it was actually more efficient and detected more lesions than the radiologists by themselves. So the next few slides are going to be about a concept that you may have heard of, but I'm going to sort of present it on a slightly different angle, and that is sort of ethical AI. And um, a lot of people have sort of said, well, you should do ethical AI because it's the right thing to do. And you might be thinking, well, what's ethical AI? Well, I'll, I'll explain that. Um, it's about sort of making sure that the decisions made by models, you know, AI models, um, are yeah, explainable and transparent and justifiable and easy to understand. And I think a lot of the discussion has been about the importance of doing that because it's the right thing to do. But I would also make the case that you should do it because yeah, it's it's in your own interest to have models that you can understand and validate and um, you know verify that they that they do what they should do. 
And um, and so there's a bunch of techniques to sort of help you to do that, but you have to invest in that over and above actually creating the model in the first place. And um, so, for example, here we've got um, yeah, essentially the uh, treatment decision point for each of these factors when looking at treatments for a um, a road pavement so a pavement surface. And um, and you know, quite a lot of analysis goes into sort of creating these outputs from the models to help you sort of understand, you know, what what level of rutting or heavy traffic, you know, tends to sort of trigger a decision to make a certain treatment. And the thing about a lot of machine learning models is that they're very complex and decisions are not made on the basis of one uh, factor alone. They're made on the basis of many factors. And so it can be very hard to sort of unpick and get an understanding of like why a particular decision was made. So you have to sort of develop these graphical outputs to help with that. And one of the phenomenon that we've observed is that uh, when you explore the behavior of a model, then often, you know, it, it, they're fascinating conversations. Like you, you pull out a result where the model disagrees with an expert. And all too often what the expert will say is, oh, yes, I didn't think of that. The model is correct, but, you know, it didn't come to mind when they were originally thinking about the behavior. But in this particular circumstance, they know that, that you know, this is what should happen. And so that that sort of, you know, querying discrepancies between expert decision making and model decision making often you know, helps the experts to understand their own thought process, it helps them to remember the edge cases that they've forgotten about because, you know, they only occur rarely and so they don't talk about them. And um, this this tweet here is really interesting because this is um, a game called Go. And um, Go, it's like harder than chess. And um, the graph here shows uh, the sort of average move quality made by you know, professional players um, uh, you know, in, in professional circumstances. And you can see that up to the dotted line, up to 2017, you know, it's, it's slightly going up, but pretty flat. So something happened in 2017 that, that suddenly made all the professional players like get a lot better. And that was the advent of a AI player that was as good as the best human players. And so by analyzing the moves of the AI, the best human players also got better. And so that, that's a great example of, of how like you know, analyzing and understanding what your models can do um, can actually enhance your expert decision making. And of course, if you're developing models, then you should also invest in these sort of visualizations just to sort of understand and verify their behavior. So this is an example from, from my team when we were looking at um, modeling traffic on, on different uh, roads uh, across Austra across Melbourne. And, um, and if we just had a list of anomalously high traffic, it probably wouldn't have been obvious what was happening. But you can see all the all the sort of areas on the right there that are in, in red. Those are all the roads that had too much traffic. And what's immediately obvious by putting them on the map, that, that visualization is that they're all along the coast. And then jumping over to the newspaper, um, we found the headline, beaches are packed, it's the hottest day in a year. Basically everyone finished work and they all went to the beach. And, um, you know, in Melbourne, that's something you can't do every day of the year. And um, and so if we hadn't had that visualisation, it would have been very difficult to understand what was going on other than there was an anomalous amount of traffic. And likewise, for stakeholders, this, this plot here is an example from the Ostros project that we talked about earlier. You can create visualisations that let people quickly grasp, like, the range of, you know, policy options or scenarios that are accessible and the impacts of those. Um, so this surface here, essentially the surface shape represents the different outcomes in terms of overall um, road network level of service. And the colouring is the budget used. So the blue is the highest budget and the sort of dark red is the lowest budget. It kind of looks like an island sticking out of this red sea. The red sea represents the level of service that is delivered by last year's um, scenario, investment scenario. And uh, the X and Y axes are like whether you invest more in metropolitan roads or regional uh, and uh, rural roads. And the other axis is whether you invest more in freight routes or non-freight routes. And so at a glance there, you can see that there are a number of investment scenarios which 
have a higher overall network level of service than the one chosen. You can also see that, yeah, there's quite a lot of variability in the freight dimension particularly. And there's this kind of looks like a tear in the surface. And so interestingly, what that means is that just a tiny change in the sort of investment policy would have quite a dramatic impact on the um, on the road network. And so that sort of visualization really helps people sort of understand the potential you know, impacts of their decisions quickly. And with that, I'll hand it back over to Tim for a summary. Cool, thanks, Dave. Um, yeah, just uh, thank you, Dave, for sharing those uh, sharing those examples, and and in particular, I guess just to just to highlight um, the that I guess what we wanted to demonstrate to you today is the significance and complexity of of road asset management um, and pave and pavement asset management and the complexities in the decision process. But these are this is this is one example of one complex complex area where the technology is finding advantage and a case of recognizing that there are a whole lot of other sectors and areas um, where this technology can be applied and that the resources that we've provided via Austroads are there to enable across any domain. So just to feel free in, in seeking those out um, and focusing uh, uh, particular to 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 uh, to our our conversation this afternoon, uh, recognizing um, with regard to AI and ML, um, just the need for us to be thinking more in an agile manner, uh, not to necessarily collect all of those requirements and and consider the delivery to be something of of a waterfall, uh, all completed all at the same time scenario. The area in this in this space and our world is continually changing. So an agile approach is really important in the way that we we approach uh, we approach this, and uh, uh, being clear as Dave shared with regards to scoping uh, of particular projects, um, uh, having those having those those sort of that grounding towards uh, effectively aiming towards a solution, not just a capability, helps us to make sure that we are delivering we are delivering outcomes that are of benefit from that investment. It's very easy to to start examining a whole lot of data, explore it, discover various things, but not actually arrive at anything. Uh, that's it is a it is a, ch a general challenge across uh, IT projects uh, in general. Uh, is is ensuring that we actually deliver something effective. So uh, so yep, I guess from that from that point of view. As well, not under underestimating business impacts and the costs um, and risks attached. Uh, and uh, as Dave touched on, um, ethical AI and ensuring that ensuring that we're using this technology in the right way. So you know, it's a case of of, of enhancing human effort uh, and uh, and recognizing that that this is uh, this is a space where we want to advance uh, technology use. But as we do that. It advances our ability to be able to answer deeper, more substantial questions. Uh, 